Hello, my Hegelians. I'm back with another podcast. This time it is upon my conclusion of reading Jean Vol's A Short History of Existentialism. This volume is only 55 pages, and I think it might be out of print. I could only find a used copy on Amazon, and I think this is a collectible. It looks like it is probably from the 70s, which makes me want to wear some black sunglasses, maybe cat eyes, put my hair in a headband and go to a coffee shop and just pretend I'm transported back to that decade with this book, an actual relic. In this book, so this will probably be a bit of a review, both of this book and then Jean Vol's definition of existentialism. So for about half of it, a little more than half, um, it's just what it says. He's going through the history of existentialism, which he says in a way starts with Kierkegaard, although you can trace sort of the seeking of existence and the understanding of the consequences of that on our active lives prior to Kierkegaard, but Kierkegaard himself was the one who shined the light on this idea as we know it now. And so so basically Kierkegaard is the founder of philosophy, of existentialist philosophy, or the philosophy of existence, just because that's what, um, you know, how he approached it, how he articulated it. Even though no one seems to want to identify as an existentialist, not even Jean Vol, um, I don't know if any of these philosophers that he's talking about want to define themselves as one. And there could be reason for that. So he talks about Kierkegaard and he also talks about Jaspers and Heidegger a great deal. And it's a great debate, it seems, whether or not Heidegger was an existentialist. Actually, it is even of debate in this book whether Jean-Paul Sartre is an existentialist and we often think of him as a key commentator on the ideas. And we'll get into why in a second. And then the last half of the book, or a little less than the last half, there is a discussion. So apparently, Jean Vol sent a copy of the first, maybe, 34 pages of this, um, which is, you know, his history of those philosophers, as well as a critique of existentialism, which I don't really remember all that much. Um, and then there were um, some existentialist philosophers, or just some philosophers in general, including Levinas and Marcel, um, who commented on it. And, you know, they, they didn't hold back. <laughs> Let's just say that. It's really fascinating because this book was published in 1949. At that time, in that year, Jean Vol was about 61 years old, and Heidegger and Marcel and Jaspers were also in their 60s, very close together. So as you can imagine, Heidegger was reading about himself in Jean Vol's book, and also Sartre was in his 40s. Levinas was in his 40s, Ponty was in his 40s, and Camus was a sweet 
age of 36. So not really on the scene, probably yet, uh, as he would soon be. And that is probably why Jean Val does not, he hardly mentions Camus at all. I think there's maybe one sentence about him, uh, maybe two, I'm not sure. So, you know, knowing that, it is so exciting because I've never read a book where someone was writing about philosophers that were living at the time of the writing because he mentions how, you know, Sartre's own ideas have evolved, but again, Sartre is only 44 at the publishing of this book. So, so Val says, you know, what Sartre will, will come about in the future. Um, and that's, that's so exciting. Um, okay, so now I'm going to give the three points that I think are the definition of existentialism, because let's just get into it. So number one, we are existence without essence. Now this is different than the articulation of, you know, this sort of phrasing before, prior, because usually it is existence precedes essence. So we have to exist and then we make ourselves what we will. We make our lives what we will. And that, you know, makes sense with existentialism because basically when I think about existentialism, it says that there's no meaning except for the meaning that we create. We are meaning makers, like in Jean-Paul Sartre's being and nothingness. Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm trying to look for my copy. I think that's what it is. Obviously, I... Oh, it's over here. Okay. I don't know why. That title just doesn't sound correct. Being and nothingness. That's what it is. Why am I second-guessing myself? It's just because I've read more of Being in Time, I think. Okay, so Being and Nothingness, that's basically what he says. He says that our, and his other works, he says that our major goal, our purpose is to act. So in a way, it kind of reminds me of Nietzsche, if you take his title of his book, literally, Beyond Good and Evil. Um, it doesn't mean that existentialism is without ethics, and even Simone de Beauvoir wrote a book called The Ethics of Ambiguity. So what ethics are there? Um, and Jean-Paul Sartre, Vol argues, never got to the point of expanding on his ethics. He mentions, at the end of being in time, being in nothingness, <laughs> that it exists, but um, he just never gets to fleshing it out. At least, I suppose, at this point. In 1949. But I think I've read that actually in another place as well so a more recent work um so this is interesting so this says so if it's not just that existence precedes essence but that existence is without essence you know there's this intimation that essence is is elusive it's always elusive and that really ties into the third point so we'll skip over the second the third point is there can be no ontology in existentialism there can be no study and pursuit of being in existentialism so now we get to the reason that Val says Heidegger and Sartre are not really existentialists and does he say that I don't know. That's a that's a very strong statement. But he, you know, he's suspicious. He puts it in question. He puts it into question because you have the word being in both of their major texts, right? But yet he spends so much time on Heidegger in this book. You would think this book was about Heidegger. And it was really interesting to me because I had not prior to reading Jean Vol 
And I have another book of his as well. It's a collection of his writings, and I've just read the introduction so far, which was not written by Jean Vol. It's an excellent introduction, and I had not thought of Heidegger as being an existentialist myself, reading, being, and time. And I've read a little more than half of it. Um, so the idea then is that once you focus on being, once you seek it, once you grasp it, you are no longer existing because existence is always becoming. And this is, this reminds me so much of Heidegger. I mean, that, that is what Heidegger says in Being in Time that it's only that we are never whole, we are always, we are thrown into the world and we're always in the act of care, of caring, doing something. And we might have glimpses of essence, but then it always falls apart. Maybe because we're always evolving, you know, I had a whole podcast on this, so I won't go into it too much, but basically Vol very much agrees. But then it's sort of paradoxical then, right? If Heidegger is saying that there is real no essence, there really isn't yeah, an essence, but he titles his book being in time and being sounds like a solid entity which is what I think Vol is getting at and then the second idea is that our lives are centered on anguish we are flung into a world that we do not know and Camus says this he says that the world is unreasonable. It does not make sense. And he focuses on the relationship. So, so it's not necessarily that the world is absurd, though, because, you know, that's, I guess, the word that we're missing from our three-part definition from Vol, but I don't think he talks about the absurd. Probably because, you know, he could not benefit from Camus. Um, at least not at this point. So, it is not the world that is absurd. We're not thrown into an absurd world. It is that we are a being, we are people, an entity that seeks certainty and can never find it. The world is silent. The world is unreasonably silent. If it has order, if it has laws, if it has the answers to our questions, it's not giving it up. And so this is an absurd situation that there would be a being in a world that is silent. So this sort of existential crisis allows one to be authentic and authenticity is something else that is discussed in Vol's book it is also discussed in Heidegger so maybe that would be the fourth so I'm gonna write that down because that's actually that's actually good um what did I say that to be authentic, authenticity, um, we must be perpetually in crisis or tension or just, you know, aware of the absurd. The absurd relationship that we have with the world. And this very much reminds me of Kierkegaard. Especially, so I've read 
two works of Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling, and then This Present Age, I think it's called, on the rebellion of something. I don't have it with me. It was lost prior to one of my trips to Europe. (laughs) But in Fear and Trembling, this is really what he wants. You know, when he talks about... He wants to keep us from resolving the un, the, the logical analysis of Abraham's position as sacrificing his son, murdering his son for God, for faith, in sort of the... situation where he thinks God will save him but he doesn't really know and he's willing to sacrifice but he's also 100% sure that he won't have to sacrifice which is not what I just said but might that might not be true <laughs> but and it is it is this sort of confusing understanding of the moral and the universal and what we should do what the lesson is in that biblical text that puts the reader of it Johannes de Silencio the author of Fear and Trembling um, in anguish but this is the per- this is the ideal really this is the only Maybe ideal is not the correct word, but it is the only option for human beings anyway. And so if you choose to ignore the absurdity of our relationship with a silent world, and you are not in existential crisis often, you are not in anguish, then you are not being authentic because you are supposed to face it. So my question is, What kind of life is that? I mean, either you have to resign yourself to it in despair or be indifferent, you know, all sort of morals and tracts of certainty to the wind. And so where is hope? And this is really, Vol does mention something about hope and now I don't know where it is I think he does very briefly but Camus seems to want to I'm reading his plays I am on the possessed right now I've read Caligula I've read The Jest and Cross Purposes and now I'm reading Possessed and it seems like And also I'm reading the myth of Sisyphus. And it seems like there's this idea, well, for sure in Camus, there's this idea, oh, we should take a break. I'll be right back. And we're back. So... Camus really wants to say, he wants to deal with the subject of suicide. And he says that suicide might seem a reasonable sort of outcome of living a life with an awareness that our relationship to the world is absurd. If it is absurd, and we have anguish all the time, and we are despairing all the time, then perhaps life is not worth living, and suicide is an option. But Camus says no, it is not. Because if you, have, if you accept suicide, you also have to accept murder. And if you accept murder, then we will live in, logically, 
we will live in a chaotic world. And that's really what the play Caligula is about. It's about this sort of leader who is so frustrated because people make statements, but they don't carry them out to their logical conclusion. And so, you know, mass murder is the logical conclusion for Caligula. And, you know, this is obviously irrational and it shows that, you know, I mean, no one wants to live in that world, even if it is correct or right or making a point. And, you know, at the end of The Stranger, we have the character who ends up, you know, committing a senseless murder and... And then in The Possessed, is it The Possessed? No, it's The Just, in The Just, where there's this group of terrorists. They talk about, you know, it's it's questioned whether violence really leads to peace. And, you know, the morality of it. So Camus really wants to talk about ethics. I mean, really all he's talking about is ethics and trying to struggle with, you know, what is really just, what really is, you know, the right sort of path to take. I think that's what he's doing, but he's not necessarily, at least I don't think, I don't think he's being obvious about it. I mean, I mean, I think that we should not be so quick to say that he is sort of condemning or critiquing basically all of the characters in his works that choose violence and choose murder or choose suicide. I just feel like that would be too easy. And I feel like I need really to have a a conversation. You know, that I'm having a podcast coming out and I'm so excited about it I'm actually having a guest and I think that's what I'm going to ask him I want to ask him about Camus ethics is there a clear definitive ethics such as you know murder is wrong I think so suicide well wrong is maybe not the best term but um, you know, I'll have to think about that. I'll have to that that is my question. I was, I was out of questions and that will be that will be my question. All right. So So all in all, I think Jean Wall is being very unique basically with His number one, what I've labeled number one, we are existence without essence. I think that he is kind of articulating that in a... I don't know if anyone else has articulated that. And then, number three, there can be no ontology in existentialism. I think that's also kind of out there and pretty unique. So if anyone thinks differently let me know but you know I am just really again just to go back to this camaraderie this community of philosophers that are you know living concurrently I just think it's so interesting and I think that you can kind of look at anyone born any philosopher born within 45 years of another and that will give you a really good look at you know, who was reading who and who were, who was friends with whom and, and all that. I just think that is fascinating, you know, and we could throw, we could throw Wittgenstein in there, but of course Wittgenstein is, is not in this conversation. And, um, Bataille is also mentioned actually. Marcuse, I think might be mentioned. So yeah, so any anywhere between, so for our purposes, we could look at 
the philosophers who were born any time between 1880 and 1925 and kind of see them all in conversation. That might be a good way to pursue philosophy, kind of just reading basically, you know, a generation of philosophers, I would say. That would make that would make a lot of sense to me. And that sounds so exciting. All right, so I think that that is really all I have to say about this wonderful, lovely book. But I just wanted to end with reading the first few paragraphs of this because it's just so delightful. And I don't know if all of you will have a chance to get your hands on this book. There are used copies on Amazon but I think there's a limited supply. And this one looks as if it has another 50 years and it will crumble to dust, so. <laughs> one day, not long ago, as I was leaving a cafe in Paris, I passed a group of students, one of whom stepped up to me and said, and this is in French, but I'm not gonna try to say it in French, you are surely an existentialist. Um, oh, I'm just, I'm just not good at French. Sûrement, monsieur est existentialist. Maybe like, that was probably horrible. Um, I denied that I was an existentialist. Why? I had not stopped to consider, but doubtless I felt that terms suffixed by "ist" usually conceal vague generalities. That's pretty reasonable. The subject of existentialism or philosophy of existence has begun to receive as much attention in New York as in Paris. Sartre has written an article for Vogue. A friend informs me that Mademoiselle, a magazine for teenage young ladies, has featured an article on existentialist literature. And Marvin Farber has written in his periodical that Heidegger constitutes an international menace. Oh, and that's a, that's a really fun thing, that someone completely, in the end, um, one of the philosophers commenting on Vol's work, um, completely dismisses Heidegger because of his Nazi tendencies. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it just tickles me. Um, the philosophy of existence has become not only a European problem, but a world problem. It is no less of a problem to define this philosophy satisfactorily. The word existence in the philosophic connotation which it has today was first used by Kierkegaard. But may we call Kierkegaard an existentialist or even a philosopher of existence? He had no desire to be a philosopher, and least of all, a philosopher with a fixed doctrine. In our own times, Heidegger has opposed what he terms existentialism, and Jaspers has asserted that existentialism is the death of the philosophy of existence. So see, there's, <laughs> we have, you know, people love and know existentialism quite well today. And, and none of these people that we attribute, you know, existentialism to want to be called that. <laughs> so want to identify as it. So that it seems only right to restrict our application of the term existentialism to those who willingly accept it, to those whom we might call the philosophical school of Paris, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Merleau-Ponty. But we still have not found a definition of the terms. So you see he's kind of, he's defining it, he's saying who is an existentialist, who isn't an existentialist. So. I think that's actually, that's kind of the, the stopping point. But like I said, it's only 55 pages. I think it's quite, it's quite a hoot, actually, this book. I'm just tickled by it. I love it. I want to put it in a glass case because it just, I don't know, it seems it is a collectible. It said it was a collectible on Amazon and I thought, oh, what does that mean? And how can a collectible maybe be $9.95? But nevertheless, but when it was first printed, 
it says I think somewhere it says it was two dollars where is this now I can't see it oh no <laughs> that's another book that it's advertising 275 I mean how cute it is only 55 pages I did sort of tear it because I was trying to clean maybe like mold off of it or I don't know if it was mold but and I did but then I I scrubbed too fiercely and then I had to put tape over it so I've already I've already damaged this beautiful book further but the book that it is advertising is is six dollars a pricey six dollars and it is the dictionary of philosophy and there is a recommendation so it's edited by runes dagobert or dagobert d runes and then the reverend james carroll is is kind of giving the quote in the book flap this book is to say the least all that its editor claims for it the astounding element about it is its compactness into a handy volume, all embracing in content clear in exposition, objective in viewpoint, and earmarked by a correctness that is inescapable. The editor has used unusual keenness in choosing the contents of the dictionary and in selecting the authors best suited for a concise exposition of each subject discussed. The teacher, the student, or the layman will find the volume invaluable in his philosophical studies and will save time and labor by having it at hand. The space given is always in proportion to the philosophical and historical importance of the subject and research is made easy by the bibliography and quotations. This less than 400 page volume definitely fills up a lacuna in the English language as far as the field of philosophy is concerned. And look at that, theology, and philosophy loving each other because that's what a reverend said about it. I don't know, I wonder if I can if I can send a letter to the Philosophical Library at 15 East 40th Street in New York and inquire about some of these lovely books for $6, $10, $7.50. I mean, really, some books are just as inexpensive today, somewhat. There are a lot of books for like ten dollars but could i get the philosophy of nature by jacques maritain maritain for three dollars today i don't know or the essays in science and philosophy by alfred north whitehead for 475 i don't know surely not bertrand russell's dictionary of mind matter and morals for five dollars well, perhaps I'll have to write a letter and send it off and see if I get a response. <laughs>